Hello there. Welcome to the Saroy channel, wherever you are in the world. And so much love to each and every one of you. How are you doing? I do hope you're doing remarkably well. I'm doing great, thank you very much. And I'm so delighted you've joined me for a fabulous story tonight. But before we get started, don't forget to subscribe to the channel. Click the notification bell and the thumbs up. And let's get started with tonight's story. Dear Sarah and all your lovely listeners, it had been three long weeks since the rather unfortunate incident at our cabin, otherwise known as Seal's Cove, which was one holiday cabin among three, on one of the basins of Puget Sound on the Hood Canal, overlooking the same stretch of rather rocky beach. I truly thought my life was completely over, or at the very least, it would never ever be the same again. I mean, how could it be? It was when the most precious person in my entire life, my beloved daughter, had been taken from me so suddenly, even though after the extensive searching that was done by the police, eight hours later, to my huge relief, against what seemed like insurmountable odds, she had been found safe and well, wandering around the place like a spaced-out zombie, barely even recognising me as her own mother, and apparently having absolutely no recollection of what had happened to her. She had emerged from the woods covered in dirt with pieces of grass and leaves sticking out of her rather tangled honey-blonde hair. She had been covered with scratches from thorny briars all over her naked legs and arms. She'd only been wearing shorts and a t-shirt at the time. I remember the unbridled, unparalleled joy, an overwhelming sense of relief, when I held her in my arms again. I had reconciled myself to the horrifying reality that I might never see my daughter again. Everyone knew when a teenager was abducted, it was always nefarious, and it was unlikely to lead to a positive outcome. I had watched enough crime documentaries on television to know that this was often the case, so I had prepared myself for the very worst news that no mother would ever wish to hear. I was naturally very afraid that my daughter Myrtle had been violently raped or murdered by some pervert who fancied young teenage girls, and after he had used her for his sick purposes to fulfil his warped fantasies, he would lightly discard her like an old packet of chips lying on the sidewalk for anyone to tread over. Such a deranged person would fail to realise the devastated trail of shattered hearts he would invariably leave in his wake, as psychopaths like that have no concept what they do to people when they bulldoze their lives with their callous, ill-considered acts. Obstensively, if a victim like my daughter is left alive after such a violent attack, will that person ever be the same again? Are they not permanently damaged and broken for having been so violently abused? I think so. So when I saw my beloved daughter again, I did not want to let her go. For even though she was only 16 years old at the time, to me no matter how old my daughter would become, she would always unquestioningly remain my beloved most treasured little girl, and be like Peter Pan in my eyes, for to me she would never, ever grow up. When my daughter was vindictively abducted by a person unknown, that eight-hour stretch might have been a short time to a lot of people, but I assure you, every single excruciating second of her disappearance may as well have been an entire lifetime to me. The hours had stretched before me, like a bottomless pit, where there seemed to be no end in sight. So many parents who find themselves caught up in my unfortunate predicament, rather like checkmate on a chessboard, they know that things will never ever be the same again, and they live with a very real fear that they may never be reunited with their child. These hellishly unbearable thoughts had brought me close to a mental breakdown. Prior to my daughter's fortuitous abduction, I had naively wallowed in the delusional belief that bad things only ever happened to other people, but not to me, nor to my little girl. These were the stories I heard on the news, where a little voice in my head would say, Thank God that's not me, until one day my worst fears were played out, rather like a script in a movie. In truth, you feel as if you've been dragged, kicking and screaming, into a psychological thriller of which you want to play no part, like an actor who hates the script and flings it back at the producer indignantly and storms out of the studio saying, I'm not playing this part, not over my own dead body. 
Unfortunately, sometimes the script rolls out, and whether you like it or not, and whether you've agreed to accept the part or not, you have to play it regardless. It's like being flung into a game of Jumanji and having no idea what the ultimate outcome of the game will be, but you have to play it regardless. In truth, all I wanted to do was to curl up into a fetal position, blocking out the entire world and pretending that none of this had ever transpired, because real life can be torturously cruel. My beloved family cabin, Seals Cove, a name given to the place by my grandfather, had suddenly lost its alluring gloss all over one weekend. It was almost as if it had been badly contaminated by that foul, rancid stench of one of the odious worst days of my life on record, apart from, of course, the day when the police arrived at my front door, when my daughter was only five years old at the time, to announce to me that my husband had been fortuitously killed while out riding his bicycle down the street, in our leafy green, very quiet Seattle suburb, by what can only be described as a nonchalant, irresponsible driver, who, according to witnesses at the time, did not appear to be looking where he was going, and was so caught up on his cell phone talking to a business client of his on Labour Day weekend, of all things, when, by all accounts, there was barely a soul out and about. That simple call had cost my husband his life, robbing and depriving my daughter of ever getting to know her father. I resented the driver for driving without due attention and caution for many years, until one day I chose to forgive him. I just couldn't go on living with the accumulative resentment inside me, because it would have made me a very bitter woman. It had been a tough, very arduous time in my life, but I had a daughter to raise and couldn't wallow in my own grief. I had to get on with being a mother, and that is invariably what I did. My late husband Jonathan would not have expected less of me, and I wasn't going to let him down in any way, shape or form, and I would make him proud of me. If I did anything well in this life, I was going to raise my daughter to be a full-rounded, upstanding citizen. That's all any parent can do, for we all want the very best for our children. But the harrowing truth of it all is that we can't watch our children 24-7, even though we would love to have eyes in the back of our head, if we so could. Obstensively after everything that had transpired that harrowing, inauspicious day when my daughter was fortuitously abducted, I felt as if I had been mown down by a forklift truck on the highway and was trying to pick up the pieces of my life to make sense of everything. I still didn't have answers, as even though my daughter had returned to me safe and well. Although, like anyone who's been through a traumatic ordeal, she was naturally flustered from the experience. I desperately wanted answers. I really needed to know how and why she was abducted in the very first place. The enigmatic questions rolled in tirelessly like the unceasing ocean waves that gallop across the shoreline in an effortless smooth rhythm. I was thankful my daughter had not been raped, as that is every parent's worst nightmare. I was grateful for small mercies, but why had she been snatched away like that? For what purpose? To what end? I wondered if a deranged stalker had been watching her surreptitiously and following her around, like one of those besotted celebrity fans who attach themselves to people in the spotlight, as they feel some kind of close affiliation to someone they barely know. Let's not kid, there's some weird people running around the place that probably should be on medication. In my day, many of these people were placed in mental facilities, which incidentally, I don't like at all. But in the same breath, I certainly do not like the thought of unmedicated people with serious mental health conditions potentially being dangerous, being able to wander around freely. People who are capable of doing anything, especially if they're hearing voices in their heads telling them to do these obscene things. The very thought of it gives me the chills. My daughter claimed to have no memory of her abductor, so she couldn't even give a police artist a description of what he'd actually looked like. This was bitterly disappointing to me, because if a picture had been drawn of the young man responsible for abducting her, Maybe someone local might know who he was and hopefully draw the police closer to finding him and making an arrest. I'm afraid to say my daughter was not forthcoming about anything and conveniently claimed to have no memory of the event at all. Indeed, she seemed to just clam up like an oyster in its shell. 
The police believed her claims of amnesia, because I think it suited them to do so. As with no new leads, you can forget about a case, and move on to another one, can't you? Indeed, some might say it's not a case at all that is deserving of any scrutiny or investigation, as my daughter returned to me unharmed, safe and well. But that's not the point. I disagree on that, as someone had abducted her, and the question was who, and more to the point, why? I remember the police officer told me very politely that they had no new leads and no DNA evidence was recovered on my daughter's clothing to give us any insight as to who her abductor might have been. Not even a stray hair from his scalp was found on her clothing, although they did find some red fibres on my daughter's clothes that probably came from the abductor's T-shirt that he'd been wearing at the time. But it was the kind of fibre seen commonly in regular T-shirts that could have been worn by 80% of our population. Sometimes we have to accept that in life, ma'am, answers may not always be found, he had told me, pulling a sympathetic face. He continued to remind me of all the 411 cases out there and said, Mrs. Cladderstone, you're one of the lucky ones. You can take that from me. Your daughter could be one of those missing 411 cases you hear about. But thankfully she's not. We were looking for her for eight hours at a stretch, and then she was found. That is an excellent, excellent result. One that we could never have anticipated. Sometimes people are never found, and searches can continue for days on end, with no answers ever recovered. I think we should thank our lucky star she was recovered safe and well. Be patient with her, Mrs. Cladderstone. She was abducted. She's in shock and is still traumatised after the event. But, officer, she's all dithery. It's like she's not all there. Give her time, as I was saying, Mrs. Gladderstone. Be patient with your daughter. Give her some tea, something to drink, preferably something sweet. She needs a good bath and plenty of rest. If she does remember anything about her abductor, feel free to bring her to the station at your leisure. In the meantime... It would do you and your daughter no harm to both see a counsellor together. The officer gave me a card with the name of a trauma counsellor on it and said, This is the woman we highly recommend. We use her at the station. She's very, very good with victims of trauma. I think she will help you and your daughter overcome this hurdle in your lives that has thrown you a curveball. It's funny, but despite the fact that I had my daughter home safe and well, I didn't feel remotely lucky. I felt as if someone had thrown a hand grenade at my life. Furthermore, if the truth be told, deep down in the heart of my gut, I didn't believe for a single second my daughter had no memory of the event. I intuitively was sure that she was hiding something from me, something that she was clandestinely refusing to share with anybody. I didn't like the thought of my daughter keeping a secret from me. Let's just say a mother always knows when her daughter is being economical with the truth and there was definitely something a little shifty in my daughter's demeanour that made me almost certain that there were things she was keeping from me, things she didn't want me to know about, that made my antennae begin to wag rather vigorously, like a dog's tail. I longed for my daughter to talk to me, to tell me what had really happened that morning, but my daughter could be like a closed book at the very best of times, and she would look at me with a blank face and say, "'I can't remember anything, Mum!' Believe me, it's much better that way. I don't see how you can say that, Myrtle. You forget, I witnessed the young man abduct you with my very own eyes. He threw you over his shoulders as if you were a sack of potatoes and ran with you on his back. You have no idea, love, no idea at all, what that did to me. I thought I'd never see you again. Do you have any idea what it's like to be a mother? helplessly watching your daughter being snatched away from you like that. You were screaming, and when you cried out, it was like a knife piercing through my guts. I can't believe you don't remember a thing. Surely there must be something you can recall about the man. He needs to be thrown into a prison cell. But the police are no closer to making an arrest. The officer says your case has completely befuddled him. And we don't know if your abductor let you go or whether you successfully escaped him. 
It so would help if you could remember something, love. Please try and think. My daughter frowned, rolling her eyes in the back of her head. Mum, must we go over this again? I was abducted. Big deal. It's over now. I'm safe. Isn't that what matters? I was not harmed, nor was I raped. I don't want to think about what happened to me, but you keep harping on about it. I really don't want to be reminded of any of it. Can't we just let this go? I told you, I can't remember a thing. I appreciate, sweetheart, that you don't want to talk about any of this. That's perfectly understandable and completely natural. But if you can try to remember what your abductor looked like, it would give the police a flying start in the case. And it might get closer for us to be able to successfully make an arrest. In true belligerent teenage style, my daughter waved her hand in front of her face, as if she was squatting me away like an annoying fly. Mum, she snapped. Get over yourself. I'm fine, aren't I? Isn't that what matters? I very much doubt the person that abducted me is going to show his face around here any time soon. And I keep telling you, I don't remember him or anything that happened to me. Nor do I want to remember. So can't we please change the subject? I sighed in exasperation, as I knew very well that trying to suck blood out of a stone was pretty much useless, and I was not going to get any further information out of my daughter, so I might as well quit while I was ahead. As a consequence of the events that transpired that had sucked the very life out of bone, marrow and sinew, I was now stuck in my home in Seattle with my daughter. To be fair to Myrtle, she always was devotedly at my side, attending to my every need. But as far as being a mother was concerned, and attending to hers, I was pretty useless. In truth, I should be looking after her, not the other way round. But my daughter Myrtle seemed to have bounced back from her bizarre experience better than I'd expected, with the incredulous buoyant resiliency of a beach ball. She had rekindled the flame with her ex-boyfriend Neville. Things were going swimmingly well for her. She and her boyfriend were stronger after the breakup than ever before. But then I guess trauma can either tear you apart or drive you closer together. In the beginning, my daughter had pulled away from Neville's possessiveness, claiming to me that sometimes she felt she couldn't breathe in that insufferable relationship, as he never let her out of his sight. Now she could only embrace the boy she had rejected, as if his loving arms offered her solace and assurance from the big bad world. I guess she needed that kind of reassurance and stability in her young life, so she'd naturally turn to Neville for comfort, and who could blame her for that? So my daughter was doing remarkably well, and was insistent that the trauma therapy she was receiving was completely futile, because she was healing on her own. If I'd been wearing her shoes, I'd have probably done much the same. Let's not kid, Neville had been good for her. He had been a stable rock for her, assuring her that he'd take care of her so that nothing like that would ever happen to her again. How can anyone confidently promise someone something like that? Because one thing I've learnt about life is there are no guarantees at all. In truth, I was happy that Myrtle had someone to talk to about everything. Even though my late husband Jonathan was no longer around and was long since dead, I missed him more than ever before. I would love to have had his large shoulder to cry on, especially after facing such a debilitating, dreadful scare like this that had left me feeling vacuously empty and completely helpless. It was tough always trying to be the strong one in the family when you felt the world crumbling beneath you, like a house built out of grass that might easily blow away if the winds became boisterous enough. I was still trying to grievously recover from the aftershocks of my daughter's abduction, as if my physical body had gone through a cyclone itself, and as a consequence was battered and blue from the jarring experience, even though I was the one that was not abducted. But I might as well have been, because everything my daughter had been through, I'd experienced twice over in my own imagination. And sometimes the roller coaster rides your fertile mind can take you on when you are worrying are enough to turn your hair grey overnight. I was emotionally spent, extremely fatigued. I was trying my level best to get my act together, to grow a pair, but it was easier said than done. I'm not sure that the trauma counselling was actually helping. Nor was the doctor, 
who had prescribed me some antidepressants, but they too did not appear to be working. My trauma counsellor who did home visits, I'm thankful to say, was eagerly urging me to take small steps a little at a time, to go for a walk in the neighbourhood, for example, get some fresh air, exercise and sunshine. But I could not bring myself to get out of the house at all. I had become a shadow of my former self, like a hermit crab tucked away tightly in its little shell, reluctant to ever come out again. Likewise, I was afraid of any predator lurking in my mist, waiting in the tenebrific shadows to tear me and my daughter apart. I wondered, could I trust anyone any more? Could I trust anyone ever again? My daughter's abductor was still out there somewhere. Was he watching us? Maybe he was laughing at us and at the police for being unsuccessful in making a conviction, for he had outsmarted us all. My daughter's abductor had not managed to keep Myrtle for reasons I couldn't comprehend. By all accounts, the world had suddenly become a very predatory place for me, and it was as if me and my daughter had become all but prey. I had to keep looking over my shoulders again and again, like a frightened rabbit, always watching out for a stalking fox on the prowl. I realised I was feeling nakedly vulnerable and insecure like this, because all of a sudden, in the blink of an eye, the world I thought I knew to be a safe and secure one had become all topsy-turvy and had been callously hijacked by the cruel realisation that life is not always a bowl of cherries and that bad things can happen to good people, people that are as innocent and naive as my daughter. I know that the world is not a fair place, but whoever said it was, it is really like playing a game of Russian roulette. You're never going to know the long-term result of anything. Some of us get lucky in our lives, others less so. I do know this to be true. I have friends whose lives appear to go by so perfectly smoothly. Nothing untoward ever happens to them, while some people I know don't have it good at all. They have sledgehammers thrown into their lives, with one bad thing happening after another. And yet I will say this about them. These stoic individuals have risen above their storms like heroes, and I have huge admiration for their courage. I need to follow in their example and allow their stories to inspire me. Let's just say the events of that unfortunate day when Myrtle was taken from me still kept replaying in my mind over and over again like a broken record that I wanted to pull out of the mains power supply because it was playing the same damn ominous tune over and over again. At night I'd wake up from my nightmares drenched in a furious sweat where I'd have heart palpitations and panic attacks. It was too dreadful for words. This had to stop. When the police questioned me that day, they kept saying, Ma'am, please tell us everything you remember. What did the perpetrator look like? Did you see him clearly? I remember privately wanting to throttle the police officer and shake him so hard. Find my girl! I wanted to scream into his ears. Find my girl, for God's sake! Don't just sit there like a great big buffoon! Do something! The officer had looked at me through his kind grey eyes and began to make notes with a chewed-up pen into a little black book that he carried on his person. He had chewed the life out of the back of his biro pen. It was probably a nervous habit that he lightly procured from dealing with overwrought people, much like myself on the job. "'Why are you not looking for my daughter?' I was screaming at him in my mind. "'If you sit here making ridiculous notes, that perpetrator could be long gone by now.' I'm better looking for my daughter myself than relying on the police to help me out. I locked my hands together tightly and said very curtly, I told you, officer, it happened very quickly. I can't remember details. Everything is very vague. My daughter's abductor was wearing a red T-shirt. I do know that. He was young, with mousy brown hair, probably in his late teens to early twenties. I can't be sure because I'm never very good with age. Besides, it was difficult to see, because I was seeing him from a distance. He was well built, but I could only see his back view. He went up to my daughter very casually to engage in conversation with her. I imagine he was asking her something. I've no idea what they were talking about, but the banter between them appeared good, light-hearted and friendly. Well, it seemed like that at the time. My daughter smiled at him very warmly. They talked for a second, and then he just grabbed her, 
ran off with her. She was screaming so loudly, officer, kicking her legs up and desperately trying to free herself from his grasp. But he had so much brawn on him. She didn't stand a chance. I tried to give her a chase, officer, from the patio where I was sitting. But I was wearing flip-flops. So when I ran after her, I slipped out of them and fell. My feet discharged themselves from my flops and I twisted my ankle. I couldn't get desperately far. I was in agonizing pain. But I will tell you this, officer, the young man seemed to be some kind of athlete because he could run pretty well. My daughter was light, but he was a strapping man. So she didn't stand a chance against him. At the time, I abandoned any self-conscious feelings of embarrassment and began to cry with tears pouring down my cheeks that I wiped away with the back of my hand. Whatever my daughter was, I knew she needed me. The last thing I needed to do was to blubber like a baby in front of these kind officers who would undoubtedly console me with tissues and yet more nauseating sweet tea. I knew my emotional outbursts would only serve delay the investigation, prolong the agony and, of course, the search for my precious little girl. Finding my daughter and her perpetrator was of paramount importance. Everything else could wait. My tears could be put on the back burner until there really was something to cry about. My daughter was still probably alive, probably even fighting for her life. So while this was the case, there was still hope, a beacon of light that was burning brightly that I hoped would never, ever go out. I know this is very distressing for you, Mrs. Cladderstone. Very, very upsetting, said the female officer sympathetically, handing me a box of tissues. You have my deepest sympathy, you really do. I took a tissue from her gratefully, blowing my nose very hard into a tissue and wiping my red puffy eyes. She continued, I can't imagine what you must be going through, Mrs. Cladderstone. I really can't. Do you have any children, officer? I asked her rather bluntly, already assuming her likely answer, for she looked way too young to have children. My guess she was probably between 23 to 25 years old, fresh-faced and bright-looking, with wide, innocent hazel eyes that still had a lot of learning to be done. But working for the police and experiencing some of these cases would soon surely wipe the dewy zest away from her eyes. The young officer flushed, her face growing bright pink. She shook her long mane of brown hair that was tied up in a neat no-nonsense ponytail and said, No, I don't. Well, there you go, then, I said rather brusquely. How can you possibly know how I feel? Myrtle is my only daughter. She's all I've got. Her father died when she was only five years old. Can you imagine that? I don't know how I'm going to cope without her. The thought is just too dreadful, too inconceivable for words. You have to find my girl. You need to be out there combing the woods looking for her, not sitting here asking me questions like this. That's why, Mrs. Cladderstone, said the female officer, reaching over to me to squeeze my arm encouragingly. We need to focus on finding your daughter so she returns home safe and sound to you. That's the whole point. That's why we need to ask you all these questions. Are you going to focus on finding her? Are you really? I asked. Why do I not believe that? I'm struggling to believe that. You people are quick to make promises. But I wonder, do you deliver on them? I've listened to statistics, you know. They say out of 100% of crimes... Sometimes 80% are not solved. I watch the news often enough. How murderers and rapists always get away with their insidious crimes and are never found. If the police did their jobs properly, there'd be greater arrests, would they not? And some of these evil, insidious people would be locked behind bars, never permitted to see the light of day ever again. Well, that may be true, Mrs. Cladderstone. Rest assured, the Mason County Sheriff's Office takes abduction cases very seriously, which is why we need to ask you all these awkward questions. Tell us from the very beginning, Mrs. Cladderstone, everything that happened. What your daughter was wearing, what she was doing at the time that she was abducted. Think about these things very attentively, Mrs. Cladderstone, and don't overlook anything. Because sometimes, believe me, the smallest tidbit of information can give us details and insight that can lead to an arrest and the safe recovery of your daughter. 
So we do need to go through all the details of your daughter's disappearance with a fine tooth comb. Do you understand where I'm going with this? But I told you, officer. I've told you everything I know. Me and my daughter Myrtle come here to stay at the cabin over the long weekends quite regularly from Seattle for a break. The trip isn't too bad, you see. The cabin belonged to my grandparents. And me and my daughter just come here all the time because we love it so much. We've never had any trouble. Until now, of course. I can see why you love coming here, said the female officer, who was sitting next to the male officer on the couch. And I was sitting in the chair only a hair's breadth away from her. It's so beautiful here. It's idyllic. What's not to like about this place, with the woods and the stunning views over the canal, and those very dramatic rocks? They're a delight to behold. I'd live here myself if I could afford a place like this. Tell me, Mrs. Gladstone, how old is your daughter? The male officer asked. He spoke with authority, but also with extreme kindness. My daughter is sixteen years old. Of course, at that age, she thinks she's incredibly mature. She thinks she's sophisticated and all that. But the reality is she's very young, very callow, very impressionable. So I worry about her. It's too dreadful to words to think that this man has abducted her, taken her to God knows where. And what is he doing to her, officer? That's the big question. Is there anyone you know, Mrs. Cladderstone? Anyone at all, even in your family? family members, perhaps, that would wish to harm your daughter. I need you to think about this very carefully, he asked gently. Has your daughter done anything to upset anyone, perhaps? A girlfriend or boyfriend, perhaps, provoked anyone to jealousy? You see, ma'am, with all the social media these days, teenagers can get caught up in a lot of stuff. Oh, no, nothing like that. My daughter is a desperately sweet person, officer. Well, maybe not to me. You know, she's a tumultuous teenager, belligerent and all that when it comes to me. But to everybody else, she's perfectly lovely. She hasn't got a bad bone in her body. No one would ever wish to hurt her. Everybody loves my girl. But what about boyfriends, Mrs. Cladderstone? Is your daughter in a relationship with anyone at the moment? Not any more. She broke up with her boyfriend a week before, you see. We came to the cabin, and that was the reason why we came, actually. I suggested we came here because she was very upset. I knew it would do my daughter a great deal of good, help her to get away from her guilt, so to speak. I think even though she wanted to break up with Neville Mayers for quite a while now, she was rather reluctant and hesitant to do so. She didn't want to hurt his feelings, you see. So she was grievously upset about making him upset, if you know what I mean. A bit of a vicious cycle, you could say. Myrtle is a very sensitive soul, you know, officer. She gets dreadfully upset even if I kill a fly on the mantle. Those things are very nasty. But my daughter sees good in everything and in everyone. By all accounts, Neville didn't take the breakup terribly well. He's extremely besotted over my daughter. Leaving him was the best decision she ever made, as far as I'm concerned. Why do you say that, ma'am? Well, you know, officer, he's terribly possessive towards her. Which made me distinctly uncomfortable, as it did her. My daughter does not need an intense relationship at such a young age. She should enjoy being young, footloose and fancy-free, shouldn't she? She doesn't need to be tied down to a serious relationship at her young age. Well, would you believe it, I actually happened to bump into Neville's father at the local Walmart about three weeks ago. Do you know what he said to me, officer? He said, I don't attend my son's weddings, I'm afraid. My ex-wife would never let me attend. So when my Neville marries your daughter, you will know why I'm not there. I'm afraid me and the ex... There's a rather turbulent, rough history between the two of us. We don't get on at all. We can't even be in the same room together without everything combusting, if you know what I mean. So please don't be greatly offended when I don't attend your daughter's wedding. He said that to you? Said the male officer, looking distinctly curious. That's pretty heavy. Your daughter's only sixteen. 
Well, of course. I mean, she thinks she's so mature, doesn't she? She thinks she's sophisticated and stuff like that. But she is still a little girl, as far as I'm concerned, who's got a lot of growing up to do. It freaked me out, let me tell you, to hear, you know, Neville's father talking like this. My daughter's still a child. The last thing she needs is to concern herself with getting married. So that conversation greatly troubled me. I can imagine it did, ma'am. My conversation with the male officer appeared to have piqued the female officer's attention. She leaned forward to study me closer. Tell us all about Neville Myers, Mrs. Cladderstone. I'm very interested to hear what you have to say about him. From the sounds of things, based on what the father told you, that young man is very, very serious about your daughter. And as you say, your daughter is still very young. So as far as I'm concerned, it's a bit of a red flag having her boyfriend that fixated over her. Well, it is a red flag. That's exactly how I see it, officer. It concerned me greatly. Of course, don't ask me very much about him, because I can't give you much insight into him. Because my daughter is very secretive about him, as girls her age so often are when it comes to their boyfriend. I have met the father a couple of times because he came around to the house with his son. That's why I recognised him at the Walmart. Oh, I see. So that's why you recognised him, said the male officer, making a hurried note in his notepad. Do you know the father's name by any chance, Mrs. Cladderstone? Yes, his name is Simon. I will say father and son are carbon copies of each other. Neville is a very good-looking young man. Doubtless he could have his pick of the girls if he wished. You know the type, sporty, extremely clever, great grades and doubtlessly a promising future ahead of him. Neville's well-built, dark hair, green eyes, so he's everything a teenage girl would swoon over, if you know what I mean. So there we are, that is the end of part one. Part two is tomorrow night. I look forward to you joining me then. Until next time, goodbye and good night.